By the end of the 7th century, the Tibetan Empire had grown from a small tribal confederation to become one of the most powerful and influential factions in all of Asia. Despite its military and diplomatic success, however, the empire was divided against itself and hard-pressed by its enemies. Under the leadership of the Empress Wu, a resurgent Tang dynasty had captured the walled cities of Khotan and Kashgar, depriving the Tibetan Empire of vital access to the lucrative trade routes that crossed the Tarim Basin. And in the distant west, there were rumors of a new power rising, a religious movement founded by an obscure figure named Muhammad. Meanwhile, within Tibet, tensions between the clans and the imperial court had reached a breaking point. The young emperor, Tri Dusong, ruled in little more than name alone. For a generation, the empire and its armies had in fact been controlled by the powerful patriarchs of the Gar clan, who, acting as regents for a series of child emperors, had divided Tibet amongst themselves to govern as they saw fit. But the emperor had begun to chafe against his role as figurehead and long planned in secret to destroy his clannish rivals. If the empire were to thrive or even survive, a conflict was inevitable, one which would pave the way for the golden age of the Tibetan Empire. The brewing conflict between the central Tibetan court and the clans came to a head in the year 694, when a series of setbacks suffered by the Gar provided Tri Dusong with an opportunity to strike. First, following the loss of Tibetan territories in the Taran Basin, a prominent Gar patriarch, Gar Tsenyen, led a combined Turkic and Tibetan army across the empire's northeastern frontier. In a decisive battle in the Taling Valley, however, his forces were utterly crushed by the Tang, and Gartsenyan fled the field in disgrace. According to Tibetan sources, upon returning to central Tibet, he was executed by the emperor for incompetence and cowardice. Shortly afterwards, while campaigning in the west, another Gar leader was taken prisoner by the Sogdians, who proved unwilling to broker his release. With two of the most prominent patriarchs of the Gar killed or captured within the space of just one year, the clan's ability to govern the empire was suddenly and publicly called into question. With the most senior remaining clannish leader, Gar Chidzin, away from court fighting in the east, the emperor was quick to act on the unexpected weakness of the pre-imperial clans. Knowing that it would leave the last significant Gar patriarch stranded in the field, the emperor quietly accepted a peace treaty offered by the Tang Emperor's Wu. With Gar Tridzin now too weak at court to wage war without imperial consent and too far from his supply lines to maintain his army, the Gar clan's military power was suddenly isolated and difficult to sustain. But this was only the first step in the Emperor Tridusong's plan. While the Gar's principal army languished in the east, the emperor invited the leaders of the clan and their families to central Tibet to take part in a lavish imperial hunt, but the offer disguised a ruthless trap. Once the hunt began, elite archers and armored cavalry emerged from their hiding places and attacked the lightly armed and armored Gar. The resulting massacre sent shockwaves through the empire. Before the news of the massacre could reach Gartridzin on the Tung frontier, the emperor, now fully committed to his purge of clannish rule, marched east with an army of imperial loyalists to force an armed confrontation. As the imperial army approached, Gartridzin's forces, which were now unpaid and exhausted, began to abandon the veteran military commander, and rather than face capture and certain execution, in the spring of 699, the last great patriarch of the Gar clan took his own life. The Gar were utterly crushed and would never again play an important role in Tibetan history. Through his violent purge of clannish authority, 
the Emperor Tree Dusong had accomplished something that his predecessors had not, with no significant aristocratic or clan factions capable of challenging the Emperor directly. The authority of the central Tibetan court had never been stronger, but years of conflict and civil war had taken a heavy toll, and with their resources and manpower stretched thin, the empire's position in Central Asia was significantly weaker than it had been at the height of the Gar Regency. To make matters worse, shortly after Tridusong's purge, a deadly outbreak of the Justinian plague began to ravage population centers across the Tibetan plateau. Religious persecution followed in the wake of the pandemic, in which Buddhist immigrants were blamed for the spread of the disease. And as plague and renewed civil strife racked the Tibetan Empire, its rivals entered a period of expansion and consolidation. In the early decades of the 8th century, the Islamic Umayyad Caliphate rapidly crossed into Asia pushing as far as Transoxiana and capturing the ancient fortresses of Samarkand and Bukhara, which commanded the lucrative trade corridor to the west. Warfare with the Caliphate erupted along the western Tang frontier, compelling the Tang dynasty to entrench its position in the Tarim Basin and expand its regional garrisons, making the recapture of the Silk Roads appear a near impossibility for Tibetan forces. Years became decades, and by the early 750s, the empire was trapped by its powerful neighbors, unable to expand, and slowly losing territory to its rivals. But a single event would change the balance of power in Central and East Asia, and pave the way for a renaissance of Tibetan imperial culture. In the year 755, in the distant heartland of the Tang Dynasty, an influential general named An Lushan rebelled against the Tang imperial court. Building on popular discontent, the An Lushan rebellion threw the entire empire into a brutal eight-year-long civil war. In the famine and widespread violence that followed, tens of millions died, and local rulers began to seize power for themselves. The Tang dynasty would never fully recover. And with the new Islamic Caliphate still emerging from the Abbasid Revolution, the great powers in Central Asia were, for a moment, significantly weakened. Meanwhile, in Central Tibet, following the assassination of his father, a new and ambitious emperor named Tri Song Detsen came to power. Despite his age, the new emperor proved to be a shrewd politician and a talented military commander. Seeing the An Lushan Rebellion as an opportunity to recapture the thriving trade centers of the Tarim Basin and fill the imperial coffers, the emperor was quick to act. Sending missives to his generals and provincial governors, in the first year of his reign, he mustered a vast army from across the empire and declared open war on the already beleaguered Tang. One by one, the Tang-controlled fortresses that guarded the northern Silk Road fell in rapid succession. Their garrisons emptied to fight against the rebellion in the east, they were little match for the invading Tibetan forces. Detachments of light cavalry swept across the desert flatlands, raiding caravans and ambushing the lightly equipped local auxiliaries, while heavily armored infantry marched on the ancient walled cities that controlled the region's vital trade. Historians know very little about the individual engagements fought during Tri Song Detsen's northern campaigns. However, according to both Chinese and Tibetan sources, in the first two decades of his reign, the Tibetan Empire made dramatic territorial gains. Its armies crossed the entirety of the Tarim Basin and pushed far to the northeast, reaching the barren edges of the Gobi Desert. The Tibetan advance was finally slowed at the oasis city of Dunhuang, which desperately resisted Tibetan conquest and was only captured after a bitter 11-year-long siege. As wealth from newly conquered territories flowed into the imperial court, the emperor, now emboldened by the early and dramatic success of his armies, planned a daring campaign that reached beyond anything attempted by his predecessors. Allying himself with the southern kingdom of Nongshao, 
infantry song Detson assembled an army of over 200,000 infantry and heavy horse, which he encamped in eastern Tibet. Striking out from Asha in the early autumn of 763, the imperial army marched straight for the great metropolis of Chang'an, the capital city of the Tang Dynasty. With their capital located close to the Tang frontier and their armies deployed on distant battlefields fighting the last remnants of the Anlushan rebellion, the Tang were caught completely by surprise. And in December 763, with Tibetan cavalry threatening to encircle the city, the Tang Emperor fled the capital with his court retainers, commanding the garrison to hold at all costs. But Tibetan spies had already infiltrated the court, and as the Tibetan army approached from the west, a high-ranking Chinese official defected to the Tibetan side and opened the city gates. Chang'an fell in a single day. In many respects, the capture of Chang'an is a high watermark for Tibetan imperial conquest. Though the city was only held by the Tibetans for two weeks, the capture of the Tang capital was as much a symbolic victory as it was a military success. Under Tri Song Detsen's rule, the Tibetan Empire had awakened from its long slumber and re-emerged as one of the dominant powers in Central Asia. Despite his military conquests, however, the Emperor Tri Song Detsen is often not remembered as a conqueror, but as a Chögyal, or Dharma king, who established Buddhism as the official religion of the Tibetan Empire. In his youth, during the reign of his father, Buddhism had been subject to widespread religious persecution. Across central Tibet, Buddhist relics were either buried or destroyed, its temples were vandalized, and Buddhist rituals were outlawed in public. Nevertheless, at an early age, the crown prince developed a keen interest in the foreign religion and despite the resistance of anti-Buddhist factions in the aristocracy, he promoted the study of Buddhist philosophy in his father's court. By the early 760s, however, the cultural landscape of the Tibetan Empire had begun to change. Rapid expansion brought new territories under imperial control in which the pre-Buddhist traditions of Tibet were either unknown or carried little to no authority. As the empire consolidated these dissonant cultures, it became increasingly clear that, like the great empires and kingdoms surrounding Tibet, imperial governance required a religion that would serve as a cohesive cultural force. While other significant religions, like Islam, Manichaeism, and Christianity, were in fact known in Tibet, the Buddhist traditions of India, Nepal, and China were already influential in the Tibetan cultural world and provided the emperor with a model international religious tradition that he felt could be spread throughout the empire. Whether or not he chose Buddhism due to its cultural significance and political value, or due to his personal convictions, in the year 762, as wealth poured into the imperial court from his northern conquests, in a radical edict, Tri Song Detsen publicly declared himself to be a Buddhist and began to prepare the ground for the long and difficult process of converting the Tibetan Empire into a Buddhist state. Shortly after his proclamation, the emperor commissioned the construction of a massive Buddhist monastery, larger than any structure that had ever been built on the Tibetan plateau. The monastery would be so large, in fact, that it became known as Samye, the Inconceivable. The construction of Samye was not only daunting and wildly expensive, but its complexity also posed an enormous challenge to the craftsmen and architects of the imperial court. As a consequence, the emperor invited two foreign dignitaries to oversee the monastery's construction, the Indian philosopher and scholar Shantarakshita from the petty kingdom of Zahor in the Pala Empire, who arrived with a cohort of Nepalese craftsmen, and from the western kingdom of Odiana, an enigmatic tantric adept, and some might say sorcerer, known as Padmasambhava, whose deeds are enshrined in history and myth. <laughs> 
in the time of Tree Song Betsen, the spirits of the earth, trees, and stones resisted the new religion and fought the emperor fiercely. The plains were flooded, and the great mountain fortress of Rasa was torn asunder. Disease and famine spread, and death followed in their wake. The future of Buddhism hung by a thread. Seeing this, the mantra knower Padmasambhava called the spirits by their names and clans, summoning them one by one. And surrounded by the wrathful Nyen, he calmed them and taught them the Dharma, converting the spirits of the land and binding them by oath to protect Buddhism and Tibet for all time. With the land calmed, in the spring of the Hare year, the scholar Shantarakshita laid the foundations of the great monastery and the spirits rejoiced. The monastic complex of Samye was finally completed in the year 779, and to honor the Buddhist cultures that surrounded the Tibetan plateau, its main temple was constructed in three different styles, representing the architectures of India, China, and the kingdom of Khotan. But one essential question remained unanswered, what kind of religion would this new Tibetan Buddhism be? The forms of Buddhism that existed in China and India provided a blueprint for the new tradition, but also, crucially, provided two conflicting perspectives on the Buddhist ideal of spiritual enlightenment itself. The Indian Buddhists favored a gradual approach that stressed the need to combine meditation with logic and adherence to strict ethical codes of conduct in order to achieve liberation, while the Chinese East Mountain Teaching School of Chan believed that enlightenment could be achieved spontaneously through correct instruction without the rigorous training and logic and rhetoric favored by their Indian rivals. The two positions were irreconcilable, and in order to propagate this state religion, a single form of Buddhism would have to be chosen at the highest levels of the imperial court. According to later histories, to solve this problem, Tri Songdetsen and his ministers invited Buddhist dignitaries from India and China to a monastic debate at Samye that would decide the future of Tibetan Buddhism. From the east, representing the Chan school, the Tibetan ministers invited the monk Heishang Mohyan, and from the south, the Indian pundit Kamarashila. Both were masters in their respective traditions, and seeing the potential value of a new imperial patron, arrived with caravans of goods and small armies of attendant monks and scholars. As the tale goes, for two years, Mohyan and Kamarashila argued their positions in heated public debate. Ultimately, however, Tri Songdetsen was swayed by the Indian tradition and rejected the doctrines of Chan, going so far as to condemn its practices and banish its representatives from the empire. While modern historians question whether the Samye debate actually took place, it is clear that in the later years of Tri Songdetsen's reign, Tibetan Buddhists began to see India and not China as the true source of their tradition, and financed by the empire's conquests, they began the long and arduous process of translating the thousands of Indian Buddhist texts that would later form the Tibetan Buddhist canon. By the late 8th century, Tri Songdetsen, now an old man, ruled over an empire that had been radically transformed. To the north, its border stretched across the Tarim Basin and Gansu Corridor, controlling the lucrative trading centers that lined the northern Silk Roads. To the west, the Tibetans made war with the Abbasid Caliphate and pushed further and further into new lands, threatening the ancient cities of Samarkand and Kabul. And to the east, their ancient rivals, the Tang, were already in steep decline. Wealth from conquest and taxation poured into the empire. Assimilated peoples and traders brought new ideas to the imperial court, along with whispers of the comings and goings of distant lands. And the rich cultural exchange between Tibetan and Indian Buddhists grew more and more pronounced, as new temples and vast libraries were financed by imperial patronage. <laughs> 
Later historians would look back on this period and see it as the golden age of the Tibetan Empire. For many living in central Tibet during the reign of Trisong Detsen, it would have appeared that the empire was unassailable and destined for immortality. None could have known, however, that within one generation, the entire Tibetan Empire would collapse, never to rise again, vanishing into myth and legend. This episode is brought to you by Armchair Academics in collaboration with Tibet House U.S. Visit thus.org to learn more about supporting Tibetan cultural causes near you. Thank you for watching. I'm Alex, the writer and director of the series, and I want to thank our backers on Indiegogo who helped finance this episode and also our supporters on Patreon. All of these wonderful people right here. If you're interested in learning more about Tibetan history or the Tibetan Empire more specifically, you'll find all of our references in the video description, but you'll also find expanded reading lists, commentary, and annotated bibliographies for each episode on our Patreon, as well as interviews with specialists in Tibetan history and culture, like this interview with Professor Brendan Dotson at Georgetown University, which covers the entire history of the empire and provides much more depth than we were able to cover in this episode. None of our Tibet-related content on Patreon is paywalled. It's all free to watch and free to use. But if you like what we're doing on the channel, please consider becoming one of our Patreon supporters to help us make more content like this in the future. But whatever you do, wherever you are, I hope you never stop learning. Mm -hmm.